welcome to Bright Threads in the Tapestry, a series where I piece together the brightest threads from my favorite stories and analyze them to figure out what makes them shine. My name is Varsha and today we'll be looking at several passages from The Curse of the Mistraith, which is the first book of the Wars of Light and Shadow series by Johnny Wirtz. The passages that we'll pick are from the first two and a half-ish chapters and the goal of today's discussion is to see how they piece together to paint the picture of an extremely mentally resilient character. Now, uh, The Wars of Light and Shadow is a series that I've been enjoying very, very much because of how complex the plot is. The world is uh, extremely well built and feels real and lived in. And Jani Wertz's writing is absolutely brilliant. She really paints pictures with her words. And you can tell as you read that it's written by someone who loves language, who loves what you can do to evoke emotions by picking and choosing the right words and the right sentence structures. Now, I'm not an expert in any of that. <laughs> I barely even know what I'm talking about. But what that that's kind of the goal of this podcast, to see what I can figure out from what I read uh, and understand why the emotions evoked in me as I am making my way through the series are as strong as they are. There, there have been sections where I've been left in tears. There have been <laughs> sections where I've been railing at certain characters. And to be able to bring out that kind of response, I think the writer has to be doing a phenomenal job. And Jani Wirtz is like no other <laughs> in her writing. So yeah, that's one of the reasons why I plan to feature the Wars of Light and Shadow series pretty prominently in this Bright Threads podcast um, as I make my way through the series along with a bunch of friends from over at the Page Chewing Forum. Now the passages are from the first two and a half ish chapter, so there w- they will be fairly spoiler free. Um, as the prologue tells us, the action here starts in the water world of Dasin Elor, but then we move on very quickly uh, about towards the end of the ch- third chapter, I think, to the world of Athira, which is where the rest of the series is set pretty much, as far as I know. Uh, I'm on the third book, so (laughs) I can't make claims to what happens later on in the series. But from the third chapter on of the first book, um, everything up to, as far as I've read in Warhost of Vastmark, which is the third book of the series, is all set in Athira. And I believe Johnny Woods has said that we don't go back to the previous world and uh, we kind of stay within Athira as far as I know. So what the chapters, uh, the passages that we'll be looking at are from those two and a half chapters <laughs> that occur in Das and Elor. So it's not going to be a lot of spoilers. It's mostly following the events that triggers the exile of the prince into the other worlds. That you can (laughs) find out from the synopsis on the back of the cover as well. So I'm not going to consider that a spoiler. And um, I guess the other thing that could be potentially considered spoilers is the characters that we'll meet and a little bit about their nature that we'll understand. But most of this is not strictly... uh, What it does is it paints the picture that we'll talk about. Uh, But other than that, I don't think it is really spoiling much for what is to come in the next few books. So we're pretty safe. So if you were considering sampling Chani Watts' writing or if you'd like to consider reading this series, I hope this gives you a sort of uh, introduction to the world, to the writing style and to some of the characters. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about what the Wars of Light and Shadow series is about. (laughs) It is about the wars <laughs> of light and shadow. That's I'm just being silly. But what the prologue uh, starts out by telling us is that the wars of light and shadow were waged over the course of five centuries. And there was a lot of light and there was a master of shadow. The master of shadow was considered to be a servant of evil and he had command over some dark powers, while the lord of light was considered to have attained godhood or divinity. But some priests in the current time, uh, 
I don't think I know how many centuries later this is, or if it is mentioned, I've forgotten. But some priests uh, are meditating what really happened. They think that the reputations that the Lord, Lord of Light and the Master of Shadows have are maybe uh, misattributed to them, that the Master of Shadows isn't as evil as everyone says, and the Lord of Light perhaps has more to answer for than we might think. So that's sort of the premise that the series opens with. It is the prologue of the whole series because I think the rest of the books in the world, in the series don't get prologue. So this is the setup for the story as a whole. And then um, the princes, Lyser and Arathon. Lyser is the Lord of Light and Arathon is the Master of Shadows. They are... Um, uh, enemies in the world of Dasanelor, where we start out with. Lyser uh, is the prince of uh, the kingdom of Amroth, and uh, Arathon is the heir to the kingdom of Kartan, I believe. And the two kingdoms are at war. They have been for several generations. The Kartan are uh, pirates because they have very limited resources. So the, they resort to piracy to feed their people. And <laughs> predictably, they uh, the kingdom that they steal from are Amroth. Uh, so they are at war with each other. Uh, and it's the war has been going on for several generations. So Lyser and Arathon have sort of inherited this enmity. To add <laughs> some complexity to that relationship, Lyser and Arathon are actually half-brothers. Uh, they share a mother. The mother was married to Lyser's father first and then uh, something leads her to leave him and find the enemy and also um, have a child with the enemy. Um, she is able to gift <laughs> her children with some magical abilities. And I think the king who married her in the first place, Lyser's father, wanted her to produce someone who can control shadows. But the son she ends up having actually can control the light, which we don't... It seems... At first glance, like it might be the inferior power, but we don't know yet. And then uh, to the enemy, <laughs> uh, with the enemy, she has a child who has a mastery of shadows. So Arathon uh, and Lyser are half-brothers and uh, they get exiled together later on in about the third chapter in. They get exiled to the world of Athira where we find out that a mistrait has uh, sort of covered the land and has covered it for the last 500 years. There is a prophecy that someone coming through the world gate will, uh, one of the exiled princes from the land, will uh, free the land from the mistrait's, uh, uh, I guess, <laughs> the mistrait's, ravages let's call it that I'm, I'm not as good at words as Jani words is if you read the book <laughs> you'll understand it a lot better I'm, <laughs> I promise anyway um the uh, so they are sort of the salvation of Athira and to free the land from the mist that's been covering it for the last 500 years and that's sort of where we go and eventually we know uh, from the prologue that something uh, it's possibly the enmity they carried between them as they went into the world. It's possibly something else. But those brothers become extreme enemies and they wage wars for 500 years. So that's <laughs> the war what the Wars of Light and Shadow is about. And yes, it is about the enmity and the wars that the brothers wage uh, amongst each other uh, so far into the uh, we are three books in and that is a significant portion of what happens but also the mistreat as an entity that's plaguing the land is extremely interesting the magic of the world is um, we when we were talking to Jani Wirtz in one of the discussions we had after finishing the book uh, 
she was telling us about how the magic is based in a lot of real world physics so it feels very real well thought out and um the world has histories going back um millennia each uh, age i think lasts a few centuries about 500 centuries half a millennia or two up to a millennium i think um and the <laughs> january thread us a snippet of uh some of the histories of the world from the first age i think and yeah it it's amazing <laughs> what she's built with this world the history for it the characters the magic all of it feels extremely real and lived in It's, um and and it feels like there's a lot to come we have but shaved off a little bit of the surface the way the third book is progressing at the moment it feels like there's so much about the world that we are yet to find out for instance uh, i don't think this is actually i won't tell you that because it might it, it is nicer to find out through reading the world or uh yeah listening to jani what's <laughs> narrated uh, the history of it from that discussion so i will not tell you about this but there are very interesting dragons in this world i'll say that much <laughs> uh yes <laughs> so that's about the series itself and now i'd like to talk a little bit about jani watts's writing style i i think it is clear i think i mentioned it <laughs> earlier that jani watts loves language and words it every sentence feels extremely well thought out and put together very deliberately and she uses some wonderful words uh words that have a lot of weight in the sentence so if you really think about it you can get a lot more than what you might just think at first glance from that sentence i have been rereading uh portions of the first book to put this um uh, episode together and already i can see some things that i missed the first time around and i'm only on the third book <laughs> i i believe things that are in this book have implications that reverberate like all the way down to the final 11th book so yeah i i cannot wait <laughs> to it, it's i know it's early to say so but i cannot wait to be able to reread the series once i've finished it once all the way through that's not to say that you need to reread to understand what's going on like i we've been having a great time with the series uh, there's a group of five or six of us who are working our way through the series about 100 pages a week discussing them and we've been absolutely having a blast trying to you know break down the world understand what's going on um, or like discuss what <laughs> our understanding of what's going on and basically bring a lot of uh, additional meaning to what we are reading uh, so yeah it, it it is absolutely extremely readable for the first time it does have a lot of words that i'm not familiar with which you know i look up i read on a kindle most of the time uh so i'm able to look up the words as i go and it doesn't slow me down all that much and in fact when i do find out the meanings i uh in their associated connotations it adds a lot more uh to the overall story and also i think the other thing about her writing is that she paints a picture i am not a very visual reader i don't i don't need to build pictures as i go it's sort of a bonus for me and if i do end up having a picture in my head about something it's usually maybe that the writer has done <laughs> a really good job of describing something to the point where like i didn't have to put in the extra effort to paint myself a picture it just sort of uh, visualized itself in front of me uh this is in comparison to my husband we had a conversation recently where uh we listen to audiobooks together when we commute and he keeps losing track of what's going on because his picture is interrupted which i thought was very interesting because i any pictures i can form in my head are a bonus uh they're not necessary for me to follow along but apparently they're necessary for him so anyway if you're a visual reader i think you will love jani watts's writing because she really paints pictures with words i'm not a visual reader and i'm 
able to have fairly clear pictures in my head. But also uh, in the cases where I don't, I just love how the words are strung together. To It feels like poetry. <laughs> I love how succinct her word choices are often and uh, how just even with just the words, the way they are strung together, they are beautiful. So yeah, absolutely, I'm having a blast. This is some of the best writing I've read. Um, and yeah, I'm loving the series. So that's the reason for my decision to prominently feature this um, Wars of Light and Shadow series <laughs> uh, in this Bright Threads podcast that I have started. Um, I think we're going to be reading it over the course of another year, year and a half at least. So expect <laughs> these episodes to run for at least that long, if not longer, because I don't think I'll be covering the passages at the rate we are reading the books because I'm interleaving episodes of Bright Threads with other uh, trilogies and other books that I'm reading as well. This is gonna be a, a bit of a good like few year long commitment which I'm really excited for to be able to to have the opportunity to keep coming back to these passages and ruminate on uh, some deeper things that I might have missed. So I'm really excited for that. So I've read several books by Jani Wirtz, uh, The Cycle of Fire and To Ride Hell's Chasm amongst them. The Curse of the Mistrades was the fifth book that I've read by her. And in all of them, I think one thing amongst many others that Jani Wirtz does extremely well is write these emotionally resilient characters. We have uh, Tain and Jarek from The Cycle of Fire. They start out as these physical and emotional weaklings who well, who are somewhat strong. They have some strong convictions, but mostly they have to fight through a lot of adversity to get to the point where they become these strong characters who can save the world, so to speak. And in To Ride Hell's Chasm, we have Mikael who uh, fights a great deal of... Uh, Dis discrimination and casteism and racism to uh, become an important member of this kingdom uh, through sheer competence. And all of these characters, in my opinion, give us someone to look up to when we're all we're fighting our own little battles in our day to day. They give us these strong emotionally stable characters that we can look up to and want to be like or say what would Jarek do <laughs> for instance <laughs> so um, Arathon when we are introduced to him within the first three chapters also has to fight a certain adversarial event I thought that it is extremely well done he has to fight um, the addiction to a drug that um he was forcefully given to keep him under control so that he doesn't um, use his mastery of shadow to escape. He's been uh, imprisoned and the, on a ship and the captain of the ship is worried that he might injure his crew and harm them. So he asks the healer to give him something that will just basically keep him unconscious. The healer only thing he has on hand is a drug that will bring about addiction. And so he has to, uh, so Arathon gets addicted during the span that he's been given the drug. And then he has to fight through that to come back to his former self. I thought that whole sequence was extremely well done. The sort of crumbs that are laid out in the beginning to introduce Arathon's character to make a case on the captain's behalf for why the drug needed to be given and then from there to actually discuss just how um, emotionally or mentally strong or stable Arathon needed to be to overcome the addiction. Uh, that scene was absolutely brilliant and I really enjoyed reading that so I want to share it with you today. So we'll start with some passages that introduce Arathon and describe how powerful he is as a sorcerer. 
we'll look at some passages that make the case for why he needs to be drugged. Um, and then we'll look at some passages that tell us just how powerful this drug is. And then at the scene where he uh, overcomes the addiction. And we'll talk about each of those as we get through them. So we'll start with two passages that introduce Arathon to us. Uh, it, this is from the first chapter, which is immediately after the prologue. Uh, the POV we are reading is the bosun of one of Amroth's ships. Uh, it's the aftermath of a battle that has been waged on the water. The bosun drew breath to reprimand their sloppy timing, then held his tongue. The men were tired as he was. Though well seasoned to war through the feud which ran deadly and deep between Amroth and Kartan's pirates, this had been no ordinary skirmish. Seven full-rigged warships in a fleet of 17 had fallen before a single brigantine under the he hated leopard banner. The bosun swore. He resisted a morbid urge to brood over losses. Lucky they were to have the victory at all. The defeated brigantine's captain had been none other than Arathon's Fallon, called Sorcerer and Master of Shadow. Um, and then I'm going to read the second passage, which comes a little bit later after some description of the boat <laughs> and the people on it. Horror had numbed every man left alive after the nightmare of fire, sorcery and darkness that Arathon had unleashed before the end. So... These two introductory passages are doing a few things. <laughs> they are first telling us uh, about the enmity between Kartan and Amroth that I mentioned earlier. This is the first we find out about it. Until now, we've been largely in the bosun's POV and he's been we've been sort of had the scene being described to us, um, the aftermath of the battle. So this is the first we find out about the feud. And it's sort of... Uh, in the as a consequence of the battle he's thinking about how tired his men are and how this battle is different from the others they have fought because they were ravaged by the master of shadow uh, he has destroyed seven ships out of the 17 that they have brought so this is telling us that Arathon is a powerful sorcerer and a we can potentially also guess that Amroth did not have a similar sorcerer on their side because a single brigantine has destroyed seven of their uh, warships. Um, and then also we know <laughs> this little tidbit that the Sphalin banner is the leopard. And so we're getting a lot of the details of the world, but also one of the most important things that we get out of this is that Arathon, one, is the sorcerer and master of shadow, but we already knew that from the prologue, and that he had um, destroyed seven of their ships. Uh, horror had numbed every man left alive after the nightmare of fire, sorcery, and darkness that Arathon had unleashed. So we can tell from this that he had been responsible for the destruction of the seven, or most of the seven, if not all of them, uh, ships. In Amroth's fleet. So this s sets a little bit of a stage for why he's, uh, how he is powerful, and why when he's captured later on, he needs to be drugged so that he does not weave sorcery and shadow to uh, escape <laughs> from there. So I mentioned earlier that I think that uh, Jani Wirtz chooses her words very, very carefully. Uh, it feels like it anyhow. And we can see that a little bit here. We can already see that it's the first page of the book. And we can see horror had numbed every man. So they've seen some terrible things. And these terrible things were woven by Arathon uh, after the nightmare of fire that's building upon that picture. And we are also told uh, about fire, sorcery, and darkness, the things that Arathon can use or influence using his magic. So we 
are also finding out a little bit about the magic of the world already and how powerfully it can be woven because we're given a sense of the volume with the number of ships that were destroyed with um, and these are men who um, are well seasoned to war but they have been numbed with horror and uh, they've seen nightmares <laughs> and they have been numbed with utter horror people who are used to killing and you know witnessing but uh, presumably witnessing a lot of death and uh, also inflicting a lot of killing themselves um, are now numbed with horror. Uh, so this is telling us a great deal about the world, about Arathon's magic, about the level of destruction that was caused in this battle. So um, after that scene where we saw the aftermath of the battle, what happens? We're going to pick up at a little bit of a later space. It's not uh, not a lot of time has elapsed. But what what has happened since then is that the brigantine, uh, Arathon's brigantine, we saw in the opening scene was destroyed or at least was defeated. And... Uh, what has happened since then is that they found a couple of survivors from that brigantine and one of them turns out to be Arathon Sfallon. Um, the Amroth sailors want to capture him, imprison him and keep him alive so that they can bring him back to their king. And they are certain that if they happen to kill this prisoner that they will suffer for it at the hands of their king because the king would like to use Arathon's mastery of shadow to his own ends. So this captain, or the bosun, has been left with the task of keeping him alive. But this is a man who can weave a lot of uh, sorcery and nightmare <laughs> and wreak havoc and uh, inflict nightmares upon his crew. We also can potentially guess from the fact that um, they suffered such a great loss that they don't have anyone aboard who can do magic uh, on their side and possibly doesn't know enough to see if he, his magic can be curbed. So the bosun is left with a dilemma. Uh, we'll read a little bit about his dilemma, a passage that explains his dilemma to us. Left alone to determine the fate of Amroth's bitterest enemy, the first officer shifted his weight in distress. How should he confine a man who could bind illusion of shadow with the ease of thought, and whose capture had been achieved at a cost of seven ships? In Amroth, the king would certainly hold Arathon's imprisonment worth such devastating losses. But aboard the warship Brienne, upon decks still laced with dead and debris. Men wanted vengeance for murdered crewmen. The sail hands would never forget. Arathon was a sorcerer and safest of all as a corpse. So the first officer, <laughs> the easiest way forward for him, Arathon is weakened now and is unable to help himself at the moment. But if he is able to recover, if he is provided the services of a healer, which we'll see later on that he is given uh, because he needs to be kept alive for the king. He's going to be a very <laughs> risky thing to have on board the ship because one, the crewmen want to kill him, but also he can weave shadow and he is a sorcerer. So he can also cause damage to the ship himself. We see um, here uh, that in this passage that explains his injury, uh, black hair spilled away from a profile as keen as a knife. A tracery of scarlet flowed across temple and cheek from a hidden scalp wound. Bruises mottled the skin of throat and chin. Sorcerer though he was, Arathon was human enough to require the services of a healer. So he seems to have been pretty battered. And we are told again about how uh, about the fact that Arathon is 
a powerful sorcerer in this passage where we see um, how should he confine a man who could bind illusion of shadow with the ease of thought and whose capture had been achieved at a cost of seven ships. So this is uh, getting into it a bit more explicitly, telling us that the cost they paid was uh, because of Arathon and now they have captured him, but was it really worth it? And they must also further keep him alive and potentially uh, suffer more damage because Arathon's a sorcerer <laughs> and he's safest of all as a corpse. Love how succinct that su succinctly that summarized the first officer's dilemma. He has to be kept alive, but he is safest if he's just dead and they could get it over with. So immediately now we have proof after uh, the first officer's um, fears are uh, realized almost immediately when the moment Arathon comes to his senses, he starts attacking all the members of the crew. He realizes that he's been captured. He understands the implications of that, uh, m namely that the King of Amroth might put him to put his abilities as a master of shadow to use for his own ends, which are possibly not palatable to Arathon. Now, um, I won't read you the entire sequence of his attack, but there are two lines that I'd like to highlight. The ones that are highlighted here, if you're looking at this on the screen, uh, there are two, <laughs> two uh, sentences that I think uh, really do a fantastic job of talking about the extent of the havoc he is wreaking on the ship. Inside the space of a heartbeat, the entire ship became locked in darkness as bleak as a void before creation. That is such a powerful comparison. As bleak as the void before creation. That also tells us the ship is completely engulfed in darkness and it feels really hopeless for the members of the crew. So all their fears so far that we've only seen in... Uh, sort of by hearsay, we know that he's a powerful sorcerer. We now are actually witnessing him be powerful. He's engulfed the entire ship in darkness. That's a great deal of area to cover. Um, and then <laughs> uh, we go on to further descriptions of what's happening in the ship, that uh, all the uh, chaos that Arathon is causing. But here's another line that I loved. He felt as if he handled a careening maelstrom of fury. The first officer who's trying to <laughs> stop Arathon, he felt as if he handled a careening maelstrom of fury. So he, we're, we're sensing that Arathon is angry and the, <laughs> and I guess a lot of things are flying back and forth. I love I love the words here they're so big and so powerful i i keep saying that johnny words uses a lot of words with weight to them like the word maelstrom and fury there's they're really strong words that evoke a lot of powerful feelings i think so yeah this this description does a great job <laughs> of uh explaining just how chaotic everything was around the first officer and Arathon. So we go from there with uh, from Arathon wreaking a lot of havoc to the um, sailors of the ship defeating him eventually. I forget how exactly they defeat him, but they're able to get him to stop weaving his shadows and illusion. And now we come to a conversation between the first officer and Arathon. It is a one-sided conversation because Ar Arathon's not doing any talking. Uh, so we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll explain why I'm reading this uh, after I finish reading this out to you uh, real quick. So, you should have died in battle, he said softly. Arathon gave no answer. Flame light glistened across features implacably barred against reason and his hands dripped blood on the deck. The first officer looked away, cold with nerves and uneasiness. He had little experience with captives and no knowledge whatever of sorcery. 
The master of shadow himself offered no inspiration, his manner icy and unfathomable as the sea itself. Show him the king's justice, the first officer commanded, in the hope a turn at violence might ease the strain on his crew. The seaman wrestled Arathon off his feet and pinioned him across the chart table. His body handled like a toy in their broad hands. Still, the master fought them. In anger and dread, the seamen returned, the bruises lightly inflicted upon their own skins. They stripped the cord from the captive's wrists and followed with all clothing that might conceal slivers of glass. But for his grunts of resistance, Arathon endured their abuse in silence. The first officer hid his distaste. The master's defiance served no gain, but only provoked the men to greater cruelty. Had the bastard cried out, even once reacted to pain as an ordinary mortal, the deckhands would have been satisfied. Yet the struggle continued, until the victim was stripped of tunic and shirt, and the sail hands backed off to study their prize. Arathon's chest heaved with fast, shallow breaths. Stomach muscles quivered beneath skin that wept sweat, proof enough that his body, at least, had not been impervious to rough handling. So, I think, <laughs> so far in this book, uh, we're on page 11, Arathon hasn't given us a lot of reasons to like him. We are told that he's the one who inflicted uh, a lot of damage on the fleet of Amrath. He's destroyed seven ships and presumably the crew of those seven ships. And now he's engulfing the ships, uh, the ship that he's on in darkness. He's uh, making things move around in a maelstrom <laughs> and uh, basically causing a lot of damage. But I think this passage is where I sort of started to see a different side. I started to feel bad for him in a sense. Uh, he's potentially... What we find out later on in within the next few pages, I think, is that he is doing all of this the right now, not what he did during the battle, but right now after he's been captured, he's inflicting all this harm on the crew so that they can be induced to kill him and free him somehow. So he doesn't have to, so, so he doesn't become a puppet in the hands of the king of Amrath. He is absolutely terrified of that. So he's trying to get out of it by any means whatsoever, even if it means that he might be killed. And that's the price he's willing to pay. Um, but not knowing that yet, this passage started to turn me a little bit about Arathon. I until then, I was neutral. I didn't have opinions of him because the prologue told us that he isn't as bad as might seem from the histories that are currently available to whoever's doing the meditating to figure out what actually happened during the Wars of Light and Shadow. So we know to go in with a neutral gaze on Arathon. Uh, yeah, he destroyed the seven ships and later on, uh, it fi we find out that it's the result of some sorcery he did. He didn't actually mean to destroy them. It's uh, because of some illusion that he wrought on the ships. I don't think we'll be reading a passage there to explain details. Maybe it'll come up in a future bright thread. I don't know. But for the moment, I'm just going to tell you <laughs> what happened so that we can uh, see the remaining passages from that light. So here we see that Arathon is being treated poorly, but he is ref and, and, and to be fair I think he might you might make an argument that he deserves the ill treatment because he's just caused a lot of death and also he's continuing to try and harm them from the crew's perspective but the first officer doesn't like having to treat him this way I think the first officer we don't see him a lot after this but you you can you get the sense that he's a rounded out character because we are told that this is something that's not appealing to him. He's not a man who likes violence. And earlier we saw when he stopped himself from yelling at his crew. I think it was a first officer. Uh, no, it was a bosun. I don't remember if they are the same person. But uh, yeah, when he's basically a rounded out person here. 
he's hiding his distaste he doesn't know what to do uh, earlier we see that he has to keep him alive to meet the king's expectations but also <laughs> he knows that his crew is going to try and kill him for vengeance so he's in this dilemma and he hates having to treat his prisoner this way but he has to but that's what we get about the first officer but we are focusing more on arathon we see um his refusal to shout out or uh, express any sort of discomfort at the poor treatment of him um here but for his grunts of resistance arathon endured their abuse in silence again like the word endured is uh i think it's sort of a weighty word to tell us that uh, to tell us about the magnitude of injury that's being inflicted upon him and um here again um the master's defiance served no gain but only provoked the men to greater cruelty had the bastard cried out even once reacted to pain as an ordinary mortal the deck hands would have been satisfied so he's refusing to give them the satisfaction of being seen in pain which i think is really subtly expressed here and then just real quick this doesn't have a bearing on the resilience aspect of uh, the discussion but the master of shadow himself offered no inspiration his manner icy and unfathomable as the sea itself i love that comparison and i think knowing arathon three books down i think that's really spot on in how it describes his manner when he chooses to be cold and unyielding to uh, the people he's uh, interacting with i think that that's absolutely fantastic that line i absolutely loved it now uh, moving on so we're seeing sort of the hints of the resilience aspect of arathon's character which we'll now i guess in just a couple more <laughs> passages i promise get into the details of So now I'll read you a couple of passages that explain just how potent the drug is because I think it's important to understand that in order to really gain the full picture of just how impressive it is that Arathon eventually overcomes the addiction later on. Uh, I will I'll, I'll limit the discussion to just the aspects of the drug but there is one other thing that I'd like to highlight about this passage uh, once we finish reading it. the first officer drew a ragged breath uh, so this is a conversation between the first officer and the healer on the ship sorry i forgot to mention that the first officer drew a ragged breath dacron angel of vengeance will all be executed even to the cabin steward if our sailors get panicked and slit the bastard's throat he's crazed enough to provoke them how in the name of the king can i be on hand every minute to stop disaster jaws rattled under the older man's hand he selected one adjusted his spectacles to read the label then said we're 20 days sail from the port royal given weather and luck no man can be drugged into a coma that long without serious risk of insanity i've read texts which claim that mages possess training to transmute certain poisons to make sure of your shadow master would call for a dose of dangerous potency we land at south island harbor then saved by sudden inspiration the first officer blotted his flushed and sweating brow the crown prince is there for the summer to court the earl's daughter that's only 5 days sail given just middling wind drug arathon only until then and let his grace shoulder the task of getting his mother's bastard presented to the king the healer sighed and reached for his satchel forced to accede to the plan Five days of strong possets would cause discomfort, but no permanent harm. And Prince Lysa's custody was perhaps the wisest alternative for the pri- pirate heir of Cartan. His grace's inborn gift of light was a match for sorcery and shadows, and his judgment, even in matters of blood feud, was dependably, exactingly fair. So, uh, this is our introduction to Lysa, the person who eventually. uh presumably becomes the lord of light and they they are uh, their thinking is that 
five days from now, Lyser, who has the power of light to counter Arathon's power over shadows, can take over and uh, can take over uh, keeping Arathon imprisoned, I suppose. And so he wouldn't have they wouldn't have to keep him drugged for 20 days. So this is telling us uh, that one, the drug is already extremely powerful and that it needs to be given in a larger dose to Arathon than they normally might because he is a sorcerer and he can transmute the poison. Um, so we'll see another passage where uh, that also indicates a simil similarly the potency of the drug. So we saw in the previous section that the healer of Brienne was reluctant. He only agreed to uh, give Arathon the drug because it's for five days and he doesn't think that it will cause a great deal of damage. He was reluctant to dose him with it at all, but he's okay to do it for five days. What has happened since then <laughs> uh, to this passage that we're about to read is that Lyser has come on board the Brienne to meet Arathon and Arathon um, is using the same things that he did with the rest of the crew to uh, weave illusion and make Lyser angry with him so that Lyser will uh, kill him <laughs> in anger. But what Lyser chooses instead is to leave him on board the Brienne and keep him drugged until they get to Amroth. So the healer has to keep drugging him against his will. And this passage, I think, really summarizes, one, the potency of the drug and also just how reluctant the healer was to hurt someone using uh, such a potent device. Uh about the warship Brienne, a healer sucks greedily at a rum flask in a vain attempt to dull the screams as drug-induced nightmares torment the man held captive in the sail hold. So this is what Arathon has to fight against. Eventually, when they reach Amroth and he, is wean he needs to be weaned off the drug so that he can be used by the king of Amroth for his own mm, ends, I suppose... Uh, this is what Arathon has to fight against. This drug that to a sorcerer as powerful as he has been shown to be so far, uh, it's causing him nightmares. A man who was weaving nightmares for others is now being subjected to his own nightmarish torment. So we've now arrived at Amroth. And the whole city is celebrating the fact that the last living is Fallon, uh, the enemy <laughs> family of the Seelicid, which is the family ruling Amroth. Um, the last of the Sphalen have been has been captured and everyone else has been killed. <laughs> um, there's a great deal of celebration. And now we are, I think this is the first time we get a look in Arathon's head. Uh, <laughs> I, I phrase that strangely, but it's Arathon's POV uh, from this point on. Within the city of Port Royal, one man alone remained oblivious to the commotion. Arathon's Fallon never knew the men-at-arms who carried him through the cordon streets to the south keep of Amroth Castle. Still drugged senseless, he heard none of the obscenities shouted by the boisterous mob which choked the alleys beneath the wall. The more zealous chanted still, while a smith replaced the wire which bound his hands with riveted cuffs and steel chain, without locks that might be manipulated by magecraft. When the guardsman dragged him roughly from the forge, the rabble's screams of spite passed unnoticed. The cell which finally imprisoned the Master of Shadow was carved deep beneath the headland which sheltered Port Royal from the sea. No sound reached there but the rustle of rats. Shut in darkness behind a barred grill, the last sphalon lay on stone salted like frost with the residue of countless floods. Hours passed. The drug which had held Arathon passive for over two fortnights gradually weakened and the first spark of consciousness returned. He ached. 
His mouth burned with thirst and his eyelids seemed cast in lead. Aware, finally, of the chill which nagged at his flesh, Arathon tried to roll over. Movement touched off an explosion of pain in his head. He gasped. Overwhelmed by dizziness, he reached inward to restore his shattered self-command. His intent escaped his will like dropped thread. Despite a master's training under the sorcerers of Rowan, his thoughts frayed and drifted in disorder. Something was seriously amiss. Arathon forced himself to stillness. He started again, tried once more to engage the analytical detachment necessary to engage basic magecraft. Even small tricks of illusion required perfect integration of body and mind. A sorcerer held influence only over forces of lesser awareness. Lesser self-awareness, sorry. But his skills answered with supreme reluctance. Distressed, Arathon fought to damp the pain which raged like flame across his forehead. Had, had he misjudged his balance of power? A mage who attempted to manipulate a superior force would incur backlash upon himself at the closing moment of contact. Arathon felt a small stir of fear. A miscast of this magnitude could not be careless error, but an act which bordered upon suicide. Why? He drew a shuddering breath. The air smelled stale, damp, salt sour as flats at ebb tide. His eyes showed him vistas of blank darkness. Unable to pair either circumstance unable to pair either circumstance with logic, Arathon emptied his mind, compelled himself to solve his inner turmoil first. Step by step, like a novice, he cut himself adrift from physical sensation. Discomfort made concentration difficult. After an interval, he managed to align his mental awareness. Though the exercise took an appalling amount of effort, at last he summoned mastery enough to pursue the reason. With balanced precision, Arathon probed his physical self and compared what naturally should exist to any detail imposed from without. A cold something encircled his wrists and ankles. The pattern matched that of metal. Steel. No botched enchantment had snared him here. Somebody had set irons on him. Firmly, Arathon turned the implications of that discovery aside. He probed deeper, dropped below the surface sensations of chill, ache and muscle cramp. The damage he found internally made him recoil. Control broke before a tide of horror and memory returned of the desperation that had ruled his every action since capture. He had sought the clean stroke of the sword because he had not wanted to reach Amroth alive. But now, oh now, the Silicid who had taken him had no right. Arathon expelled a whistling breath, enraged by the nausea which cramped his gut. Instead of granting death, his captors had poisoned him, drugged him with an herb that had ruined body and mind just to salve the king's demand for vengeance. Arathon stilled his anger, amazed that so simple an exercise sapped his whole will to complete. Enemies had forced him to live. He dared not allow them liberty to unravel his mind with drug madness. As a mage and a master, his responsibilities were uncompromising. The dangerous chance that his powers might be turned towards destruction must never for an instant be left to risk. Rowan's training provided knowledge of what steps he must complete, even as the self-possession that remained to him continued irretrievably to unravel. Already, the air against his skin seared his nerves to agony. His stomach clenched with nausea, and his lips stung, salty with sweat. The stress to his physical senses had him pressed already to the wretched edge of tolerance. Experienced as he was with the narcotics and simples used to augment pressions, for this onslaught he had no space at all to prepare. Slowly, carefully, Arathon eased himself onto his back. Movement made him wretch miserably. Tears spilled down his temples and his breath came in jerks. The attack subsided slowly, left his hand whirling like an oil compass teased by a magnet. 
Steady, he thought, then willed himself to belief. Unless he maintained strict mental isolation from the bodily torment of drug withdrawal, he could neither track nor transmute the poison's disillusion. Should he once lose his grip on self-discipline, he would drown in reasonless animal suffering, perhaps never to recover. Arathon shut his eyes. Raggedly, he strove to isolate his spirit from the chaos which ravaged his flesh. Dizziness ruined his concentration. His muscles tightened until he gasped aloud for air. An attempt to force will over a wheeling rush of faintness caused him to black out. He woke to torment. Doubled with cramps and shivering violently, Arathon reached for some personal scrap of self to, to hook him to hook back his plummeting self-control. The effort yielded no haven, but opened the floodgates of despair. No. Arathon's whisper of anguish flurried into echoes and died. His thoughts unraveled into delirium as the past rose and engulfed him, vivid, inescapable, and threaded through with the cutting edges of the broken dream. So now as we read through that description of just how ravaged Arathon is by the drug, we see why those previous passages that we read become important or how they laid the foundation for this to mean so much to us, a lot more perhaps than just what is described. I think the descriptions in and of themselves are already doing a fantastic job of laying out just how damaged Arathon is mentally because of the drug. But then we see, uh, if you if we think back to the previous passages that we read, for instance, his con- uh, the first captain's con- first officer, sorry, <laughs> the first officer's conversation with Arathon, in which we see that he is an extremely self-possessed man, right? Uh, He's being compared to the sea. The first captain thinks, first officer, sorry, I I don't know why I keep doing that. The first officer thinks to himself that Arathon is icy and unfathomable of the sea. So it's not that he's invoking his self-possession just because he's been captured. It we get the sense that this is someone who is generally closed off and perhaps not very forthcoming with expressing his emotions. It it feels practiced uh, because of just how deep that uh, feeling goes for the first officer. It's not. It, it's presumably not something that Arathon has just come up with because he's captured. He's like, no, I'm not going to give away anything now. It feels like something that he's used to projecting out into the world. Um, I say that now with a bit of hindsight into, uh, like, or insight into Arathon's character as much as I got from reading three books worth. But I in retrospect, I think there was already a lot of information there in that passage to give us the sense that Arathon um, is someone who uh, does not lose his lose self-control very easily. So seeing someone like that reduced to this person here that we read about with no control over what... Uh, how he feels or how he behaves. Uh, we also saw the other passage with the with the healer, where he's uh, the healer's drinking, glugging down some rum because he's hearing Arathon screaming into the night. So we saw that sort of descent into this lack of control. There we got sort of an intermediate step where this person who was refusing to react to being treated poorly, to being ill-handled by the crew of the brain, is now just screaming into the night and he has no control over his reactions because of the drug. So I think those were two very powerful scenes that laid the foundation to tell us just how low Arathon has been reduced in this scene where just mild movement causes him to retch and he's trying to do some magic 
and is failing it's backfiring to the point where if if he hadn't noticed in time it might have uh, caused his own death uh one thing that i did not read to you that happened i mentioned that lyser met with arathon and arathon um uh, angered lyser he did that by weaving some illusions uh by showing him images from lyser's past this was 5 days into arathon's being drugged 5 days of being given a very powerful drug and he still being able to weave the illusion weave the shadow and sorcery that he can 5 days then not a lot of damage has happened to arathon extend that to 20 days and now he's unable to do basic functions unable to execute some basic things that should have come easy to him um so this for instance this passage here he started again oh sorry i'm my face is on top of the passage that i'm trying to show you so here uh arathon forced himself to stillness he started again tried once more to engage the analytical detachment necessary to engage basic mage craft even small tricks of illusion required perfect integration of body and mind a sorcerer held influence only over forces of lesser self awareness so here we're told that small tricks of illusion even small tricks of illusion require perfect integration of body and mind and well when he was captured immediately after he recovered he wove some seemingly large scale illusions he engulfed the entire ship in a uh, shadow and then with lyser 5 days into being drugged he was still able to weave some powerful illusions enough to drive lyser <laughs> to anger and cause him to uh, decide to punish arathon uh, though not in the way that arathon quite wanted <laughs> so this information here is putting previous events also in new light telling us that if small tricks of illusion require a great deal of concentration and integration then the illusions that arathon wove must have required a great deal of self control and concentration which now <laughs> have been reduced to the point where he can do nothing he yeah even something as simple as just restoring his shattered self command overwhelmed by dizziness he reached inward to restore his shattered self command and his intent escaped his will like dropped thread it it is so difficult for him <laughs> to even gain back the self command that we saw in an earlier scene came really easily to him that was extremely well practiced presumably and now that is escaping him that's the level of impact that this drug has had on him and then uh the descriptions here of how he takes a step back and starts small uh, with some using his novice training to build together the pieces of his self awareness i thought those were wonderfully done they build on top of this to tell us just how ravaged he is and so uh he's now sort of needing to start from the basic first principle starting one thread at a time he was he is someone who can weave much higher level illusions or has much greater self control and self possession than he has at the moment and he's trying to gain that back so these descriptions of how he goes about getting there i think are wonderful with balanced precision arathon probed his physical self and compared what naturally should exist to any detail imposed from without a cold something encircled his wrist so he's taking stock of the situation around him and going at it a little by little he's realizing that he's been captured he's got some manacles around his hands and uh, his legs i think if i remember correctly but that that should have given him pause but it doesn't he realizes that something much worse has possibly happened to him so he needs to move on uh here firmly arathon turned the implications of that discovery aside he has discovered that he's in chains but 
it's not important right this moment he's he needs to figure out what is happening within him that's making him lose his self control altogether um and now we also get uh in a little bit of insight i think what i mentioned earlier about why arathon is so keen to not be captured because he's a very powerful trained mage and he cannot allow himself to be misused for evil or bad purposes for killing which <laughs> you could argue that is what he did all the people all the sailors of amroth were angry at him because he had destroyed seven of their fleet but in a later scene we'll see that that's not really what he intended he wove illusion to help his own ship and that resulted in a great deal of death anyway <laughs> uh just back to this scene as a mage and a master his responsibilities were uncompromising the dangerous chance that his powers might be turned towards destruction must never for an instant be left to risk raven's training provided knowledge of what steps he must complete even as the self possession that remained to him continued irretrievably to unravel so again the word irretrievably and unravel these are words that are telling us just how much control arathon has lost from that extremely self-possessed person to now this person who is needing to weave together his self-awareness one little strand at a time and then we go on to uh the descriptions of what he does step by step i think that's a really nice uh showing <laughs> of the some of the magic in this world he's a sorcerer who is trying to weave together self control he's doing some mental isolation exercises so this section steady he thought then willed himself to belief unless he maintained strict mental isolation from the bodily torment of drug withdrawal he could neither track nor transmute the poison's dissolution so we already had heard about the transmutation capabilities of sorcerers so now we're sort of seeing it in action and he's needing to isolate his physical discomforts from his mental control so that he can perform this activity this leads him into he blacks out and then he goes into a flashback where uh, he remembers events from his past that led to his current situation they are pretty <laughs> heartbreaking but we won't go into that uh, i just wanted to discuss this section where uh, he's fighting the addiction we'll move on to another passage where uh, we see further he's now given a healer the king assigns the court healer to take care of arathon wean him off the drug and make him recover otherwise the the healer will be punished and the healer is given an unreasonable amount of time to help arathon recover it, it's i think he's given a fortnight or something really short like that which the healer thinks is absolutely not a reasonable amount of time for arathon to recover from his addic- addiction if that is even possible the healer is unsure so we'll read that scene um where the healer is working with arathon to try and heal him and read about how he fights through it so this i think so we talked about how all the other passages <clears throat> laid the foundation for us to understand the extent of damage uh wrought by the drug here and we'll see that this scene now plays a role in um what the next scene means to us about how arathon recovers from the addiction So now we pick up in the scene after uh the king has ordered the royal healer to uh treat Arathon on pain of <laughs> uh death and so now the royal healer is at it he's trying to help Arathon recover as quickly as possible so we'll see a few scenes from his attempts at healing Arathon first to forego supper for south keep and the master of shadow the royal healer of amroth 
bowed his heart against mercy. The king's orders were final. Arathorn's Fallon must at all costs be weaned from the drug. Troubled by the ache of arthritic knees, the healer knelt on cold stone and cursed. A raw apprentice could see the task required a miracle. Time increased the body's demand and the doses given Arathorn in the course of Brian's passage had far exceeded safe limits. To stop the drug would cause anguish. If the man's mind did not break, physical shock might kill him. The healer lifted his hand from stressed, quivering muscle and gestured, gestured to the men-at-arms. Let him go. The guardsmen released their grip. Beyond voluntary control, Arathon curled his knees against his chest and moaned in the throes of delirium. Very little could be done to ease a withdrawal as severe as this one. The healer called for a straw pallet and blankets and covered Arathon's cold flesh. He ordered his staff to bind their boots with flannel to keep noise and echo to a minimum. They restrained the patient when he thrashed. When his struggles grew too frenzied, they prepared carefully measured possets. Arathon received enough drug to calm, but never enough to satiate. When bodily control failed him entirely, they changed his foul sheets. Morning brought slight improvement. The healer sent for sandbags to immobilize the prisoner's head while they forced him to swallow herb tea. At midday came his grace, the king of Amroth. The arrived, he arrived unattended. Resplendently clad in a velvet doublet trimmed with silk, he showed no trace of the drunken revelry instigated at the banquet the night before. Guards and assistants melted clear as His Majesty crossed the cell. His unmuffled steps scattered loud echoes across the stone. The healer bowed. Careless of the courtesy, the king stopped beside the pallet and hungrily drank in details. The bastard was not what he had expected. For a man born to the sword, the hands which lay limp on the coverlet seemed much too narrow and fine. Your Grace... The healer shifted uneasily, his fingers cramped in his jacket. Your presence does no good here. The king looked up, eyes steeped with hostility. You say? He grasped the blankets in his jeweled fist and whipped them back, exposing his enemy to plain view. Do you suppose the bastard appreciates your solicitude? You speak of a criminal. When the healer did not answer... The king glanced down and smiled to meet green eyes that were open and aware. Arathon drew a careful breath. Then he smiled also and said, The horns my mother left are galling, I am told. Have you come down to gore or to gloat? The king struck him. The report of knuckles meeting helpless flesh startled even the guards in the corridor. Shocked past restraint, the healer grasped the royal sleeve. The prisoner is too ill to command his actions, Your Grace. Be merciful. The king shook off the touch. He is Isfallen, and you are insolent. But the sovereign lord of Amroth did not torment the prisoner further. As if Arathon had spent his strength on his opening line, the drug soon defeated his resistance. The king watched him thrash, the flushed print of his fist stark against bloodless skin. Tendons sprang into relief beneath the master's wrists. The slim fingers which had woven shadow with such devastating cleverness now crumpled into fists. Green eyes lost their distance, became widened and harsh with suffering. Avid as a jealous lover, the king watched the tremors begin. He lingered until Arathon drew a rattling breath and cried out in the extremity of agony. But his words were spoken in the old tongue, forgotten except at Rovin. Um. Cheated of satisfaction, the king released the blanket. Wool slithered into a heap and veiled his enemy's mindless wretchedness. You needn't worry, said his majesty, as the healer reached to tidy the coverlet. My coat won't have Arathon broken until he can be made to remember who he is. The instant the king departed, the healer called an attendant to mix a fresh posset. The remedy was much ahead of schedule, but the prisoner's symptoms left no option. I can manage without, I think. The words came ragged from Arathon's throat, but his eyes showed a sudden, 
acid clarity. The healer started, astonished. Was that an act? A spark of hilarity crossed the prisoner's face before his bruised lids slid closed. I gave his grace a line from a very bad play, came the faint but sardonic reply. For a long while afterward, Arathon lay as if asleep. The royal healer guessed otherwise. He called for a chair and prepared for an unpleasant vigil. He had treated officers who came to endure the secondary agony of dependence after painful injuries that required extended relief from the drug. They were men accustomed to adversity, physically fit, self-contained and tough. And like Arathon, they began by fighting the restless complaint of nerve and mind with total stillness. An enchanter's trained handling of poisons might stall the drug's dissolution, but as hallucinations burned away the reason, the end result must defeat even the sternest self-discipline. The breath came quick and fast. First one, then another muscle would flinch, until the entire body jerked in spasm. Hands cramped and knotted to rigidity, and the head thrashed. Then, as awareness became unstrung by pain, and the mind came unravelled into nightmare, the spirit at last sought voice for its agony. Prepared, when the pinch line of Arathon's mouth broke and air shuddered into lungs, bereft of control, the healer muffled the hoarse, peeling screams under a twist of bed linen with the gentleness he might have shown a son. An assistant rushed to fetch a posset. In the interval before Arathon blacked out, his eyes showed profound and ragged gratitude. The healer smoothed the damp, rucked linens and kneaded his patient's contorted muscles until their quivering eased into stillness. Then, bone weary, he pushed his stiff frame erect. Informed by his assistant that the sun had long since set, he exclaimed aloud, At merciful grace, that man has a will like steel fire. So um, I just realized before we get into the passage, I try to be diligent this time about uh, moving my video around as I get through the different sections so that it's not covering parts of the text that I'm reading so that you can read it yourself if you prefer to read it at your own pace. But I missed that for one part of it. So uh, if you were reading to yourself, uh, by yourself, sorry, I did move my video now so that that section is visible. So you can take a look at it now. Apologies for that. I'll try to be more careful next time. Now, um, back to this. So the royal healer was given a fortnight by the king to uh, heal Arathon. That, according to the healer, is an unreasonable amount of time. He doesn't even know if it's possible uh, given how deeply addicted Arathon has become to the drug, uh, whether he can recover, whether he's passed a point of no return. And he, we know from this, uh, the section on the next page, that this healer is experienced. He's experienced at dealing with addiction. And he has dealt with a lot of officers who have been in a similar situation as Arathon. So we, he know, he's someone who knows what he is doing and his prognosis is in, for Arathon isn't good. He doesn't expect that he will recover. If he does manage to, he doesn't expect it to happen within the timeline that the king is demanding of him. Knowing all of this, we see over the course of this passage that Arathon is pretty close to being healed um, I, I stopped reading before we got to that point, but Arathon uh, then tells the healer that he's ready to be presented to the king. And this is within a span of two or three days. So a fortnight, and he may also, he may not even be fully recovered, if at all. Going from there to he's ready and has retrieved some of his self-possession by this point within two days that tells us a great deal about just how hard Arathon has fought against this because we've seen him be helpless we didn't go from oh he was drugged to this healer's perspective that he's now healed in two days it 
it we could think then that he's a sorcerer so he's done something to transmute the drug like we were told earlier but that's not what happened we got an interlude with from arathon's point of view where he saw just where we saw just how much of control he had lost and he was gaining it back so so the fact that he's very close to gaining his self awareness and self possession back within 2 days tells us just how mentally stable and resilient he is just how hard he has fought against the ravages of the drug and the healer agrees with us i think at merciful grace that man has a will like steel wire uh <laughs> so this tells us just how big of a feat arthon's recovery is and we also see i think get a little bit more of an insight into arthon uh, a spark of hilarity crossed the prisoner's face before his bruised lids slid close he has regained enough awareness <laughs> that he is now just teasing the king <laughs> he's the king is his enemy he's treating him uh he's ill treating him in the previous passage the king uh i didn't read it to you but the king asks the healer whether arathon will be aware of his suffering and when the healer says yes the king is pleased about it and now in this passage we see the king has come to gloat to actually witness the prisoner's suffering and So <laughs> Arathon's returning that favor by uh by teasing the king by making fun of him saying ah the haunts i hear the haunts my mother left are uh what is the word that he used are galling <laughs> have you come to gore or to gloat and we find out that it's a line from a play and Arathon was just teasing him there's a spark of hilarity in his eyes so that perhaps tells us he's someone who can have fun if he's in the right situation for it not that he is in one right now but he's not letting go of the opportunity to gain control of the conversation or the situation whichever way it is so yeah i thought all of this together did a fantastic job of giving us a window into arathon's character these were uh, i see we are on page 44 of 800 this in the first 50 pages of the book we have been given a window into arathon's character we've seen him suffer we've seen him gain back some self possession and we have seen him recover and impress the healer with his ability with with the intensity of his self possession so given that he's one of the main characters given that he's someone who's mentioned in the prologue i thought this was a wonderful way to tell us something about arathon while also telling us a great deal about the way some of the magic in the world works uh, about his mastery over shadow about his um about how powerful his abilities are i think we start to get hints of that already because 5 days into being drugged by this extremely powerful uh medication he is still able to weave powerful illusion and so i think uh there's a lot of things that are introduced in a really powerful way in these sequences and i really enjoyed tracing what aspects so i really appreciated these two last passages that i read to you the large sections i loved how they were structured the insights we got into arathon into the king of amroth even though he's just a minor character uh, how well rounded the healer and the first officer were in the various interactions we saw among them so there was a lot that i appreciated about these two passages the larger passages that i read to you and i really enjoyed going back to the beginning of the book and tracing the smaller pieces of information that helped us get to the point or helped me get to the point at least where i 
appreciated this quite a bit, the crumbs of information that were laid out in the beginning to make this a brighter picture to give us uh, more insight into what is happening than just what is on the page here because of what came previously. So yeah, that's everything I had to discuss about Arathon and the resilience of his character uh, and his mental and emotional resistance. And it, three books in, <laughs> I can tell, uh, I know this to be true, that this is just, this is a great window into Arathon's character. I loved being able to revisit it now and looking at it in the light of... Uh, what I know from the next two books as well. I did not give anything away from there. I just um, enjoyed rereading it <laughs> right now. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion too. I hope you'll consider uh, reading The Wars of Light and Shadow if it's not a series that you have read. Uh, the Curse of the Mistrate was absolutely fantastic. Ships of Marior and Wars, uh, War Host of Vastmark are just as brilliant, if not more. And there is a lot more to come. I think the next few bright threads that I will do for the Wars of Light and Shadow series will be descriptions of the magic in the world, descriptions of uh, playing of musical instruments. And, and uh, yeah, there's a lot more there for me to dig deep into and discuss in detail. I hope you will follow along with me. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Oh, I forgot to mention, uh, the next week will be uh, a bright thread from Toll the Hounds, the seventh, seventh, eighth book of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. I'll see you then. Bye for real this time. <laughs>